Welcome everyone. My apologies. Uh, if we had a few technical difficulties. Um, I, I want to uh, take this opportunity to welcome you to uh, physical literacy. Um, this presentation on physical literacy, what is it and why is it important? Um, my name is Drew Mitchell. I'm the Director of Physical Literacy for Sport for Life Society and here based in Canada. And, uh, and as I say, I welcome you all to, uh, to this presentation. Um, what we're going to do today is we're just going to go through a uh, number of slides and talk a little bit about um, uh, the, what is physical literacy, some context around it, definition, um, how you may see it in some of your contexts in, in your communities, in your part of the world. Um, so that's really, I hope at the end of this session you're going to have a better understanding, appreciation for what physical literacy is um, and how it may fit in is a, a potential solution to inactivity-based uh, issues in Canada, inactivity-based disease is now one of the number one killers of our population um, and uh, it's largely because our population for the most part is not moving enough and so I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in our discussion today. So I'm um, just going to move forward here. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, why we need to have this discussion, the need. Um, currently today, for most people, this is the landscape. Uh, a handheld implement of some sort is a pretty large, has a pretty large role in what goes on, in, especially with young people. Um, they're very focused on their Instagram, their Facebook, and all these sort of things. This is really, um, really an outcome in many ways of, of the fact that you know we have not been as uh, open in letting our kids uh, maybe have the freedom to move uh, like we all did and I'll talk more about that in a second the upside of this particular situation is it does show that young people will do time on task uh, some some maybe too much time on task on this multi in this uh, online media area uh, but the idea is is that is that it uh, it is it it does give me some optimism that uh, if we can get some of that time on task onto something more specific around moving, that is our opportunity that we can create. So in the landscape of today, it is quite different. Unstructured play is quite rare. Um, you, you know, I'd take you a moment to, I would ask you to take a moment and reflect on your own communities, your own regions, and um, how much how much are kids out there um, playing uh, in an unstructured environment. Uh, in, mo in many cases, if you think back to when you were younger, most of you, I'm going I'm to guess there's, you know, you've got a few years under your belt, that um, in this particular situation, you had probably lots of freedom. If you think of your home as the center, how far could you roam away from your home? It was probably miles. Um, in today's most urban environments, that freedom to roam is quite a bit more restricted. Um, part of it is, is uh, public fear that somebody's going to, somebody will hurt or harm our children, um, or we're too busy, um, you know, to walk with our kids to school or be engaged around that, so it's easier to throw them in the vehicle and drop them off there. Um, or you're too busy doing something else to be outside with them, so you need to keep them inside with you. So a lot of this is is really based around behavior, and uh, and so the outcome outcome is, is more inactivity, but the process has really been driven by a number of factors. Our built environment, playgrounds in particular, um, are they servicing uh, our need, the needs of our kids? Do our kids even know how to use some of those, some of those things? Um, that's part of the question. Walking to school um, has been a real, been a real change of space these days. Um, there's been some research done around this on the physiological side. Uh, a little guy this size with his backpack on. It's, um, 2,000 steps a day, that equals uh, about 100 calories a day for a little guy like this. And if we have about 200 school days a year, that's about four to five pounds over a year time span. So it, um, it really does lend to the fact that, uh, and, and probably even more importantly than that, all the great opportunities that young person would have um, being able to walk to school with their friends, make a bunch of independent decisions, and so on. So, 
you know, you, a lot of people will say, well, the environment hasn't changed so much. Other people will say, well, the environment's changed a lot, so our kids aren't safe. We have to maybe look at that a little bit more closely. What are some of the solutions around that? And then, of course, come home at, at night, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenging piece here. Are streets safe for our kids to be out playing uh, until dark? Um, so this is part of the context that is different now than, it's, uh, than what it was 20, 30 years ago. So what what has this led to? Well, this, this particular slide pertains to um, what we call a matched pair study. So in this particular case, um, we have a situation where we have, um, we have um, a set of cross-sectional x-rays of the long bone of the leg, the femur. On the top row, uh, these, these people are inactive, they're gamers, 21 years old, matched for gender and age, and on the bottom row, these people are active. Now, I don't think you need to be a... Um, uh, the... Um, the uh, oh, just a second here. Sorry about that. Um, so you can see there's two things you need for bone, good bricks and good architecture. So if we look at the bottom row here, we can see the thickness of the bone, the bricks is much better in the active, in the active bone. And again, bone is a tissue that breaks down and builds up every day. We need to load it every day. That's why when we talk about uh, activities that you load your body weight onto your bones are very important. Um, the top row uh, no, is much thinner, and not only is it thinner, the shape of it is not as strong. So part of the challenge with this is that uh, the status of that top row of inactive, inactive bone uh, actually is problematic because what happens is this bone cannot be reclaimed. So this thinning of the this bone stays with the person for the rest of their life. And that's just one of the outcomes of inactivity uh, on our body um, for the long term. Now we think osteoporosis is bad now. We can see going down the road that no matter how much vitamin C uh, or, uh, and, uh, or vitamin D, and uh, an exercise you do, uh, your bone is not going to change. So uh, there are some, some long-term outcomes that we need to be very, very aware of. I'm just, bear with me here for one moment. Hmm. Okay, my apologies here. Oop. Tyler, could you come here for a sec? Sorry, I just... Tyler, uh... come here for a sec? Sorry, I just... Oh, there we go. There we go. Good. There we go. There we go. Good. Okay, I want to show... Oh, geez, what happened here? Ah, okay, I want to show... Um... I got to the end of it. Sorry, we're just, uh, I'm on a different computer, so I'm not quite, that's the end. I'm on a different computer, so I'm not quite, that's the end. It's right there. Good. Now I need to put it in. Yeah. There we go. Great. Okay, we're good. Yeah, so I'm giving you an example from Canada um, that, uh, that shows the, the increase in obesity in our population. So 1970, our population, 10% of our population was obese. You can see that line is, uh, it's a virtually straight line going up to tw uh, end of 2010, almost 2012, we're at 27% obesity. 
and it's led to some real issues in our population. So what do we need to do to A, change that trajectory of that line and potentially bring it back down? What, you're not seeing any move? Oh, okay. There we go. Is that better? So I'm just going to talk, sorry, while these guys are helping me out here. Um, so what do we need to do to change the trajectory of that line? Um, oh, there we go. I think we're catching up. There we go. I think we're catching up. Oh, it's delayed. Okay. Bye. Huh? Bye. So we look like we're, getting, we're dealing with a little bit of a delay. It is reasonably far from Victoria, British Columbia to the Caribbean, but I didn't think it would be slowed down that much. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So basically what this next chart shows, um, so this is the example here is of what happened with smoking in Canada from 1999 to 2011. And uh, in Canada, there was a very, very focused effort to uh, eradicate smoking as much as possible. So billions of dollars spent and, uh, and, and some serious legislation to change behavior over time. So what that led to was, um, uh, was actually the 2014 numbers aren't in here, it's about 15.8, so it's almost a 10% decrease. And so now smoking has, has, has been reduced as, a, as, a, as much of a factor in, in providing disease that is actually killing people. Um, but we, more so from the policy standpoint is it shows us how we might have to approach this particular, act, this particular situation around inactivity. So what has happened is in Canada from 2010 to 2015, um, we have a situation where um, we about 85% of our population is now deemed sedentary. 62% of our population is deemed overweight, with 27% being obese, as uh, I showed you from the graph previous. We have over 2.5 million people with diabetes and over 50,000 total knee replacements are done every year in Canada. The reason we put that statistic in there is because 80% of total knee replacements is based on obesity. So it's made a significant difference. If we track those numbers out and go into a projection for 2020 to 2025, we see sedentary behavior moving to 90, 95%, obesity up to 32%, over 3.7 million people with diabetes and over 68,000 total knee replacements. So it's the trajectory we're on right now is not good. Most of the Western world is feeling this. So when it comes to economic impact, what does that mean? Well, the cost determined in 2014, the, the lost productivity was estimated in Canada from three billion per million people for a total of about $103 billion, projected to be around $219 billion by 2025. It's pretty substantial in our economy. Uh, we are a G8 country, there's no, no doubt about that, but it's a lot of money. And this is lost productivity due to inactivity-based uh, disease. In our country, um, and again, you may see some parallels to your jurisdictions, is we have prioritized a lot of our spending into a couple of areas. And I'm going to focus in on those because um, we've become very entrenched around this, and it's really led to some issues. So we call these unbalanced budgets. So with health care, and some people in our country call this sick care, we contribute about $5 billion per year per million people. We have about 35 million people in Canada. 
in education and literacy, we put about 2.3 billion, a little bit less than half of that amount. And the interesting thing is in healthcare, in our country, um, virtually none of that budget goes towards any sort of prevention or, or preventative approaches. Almost all of it is going to service people who are sick or almost sick. And then in education, most of the focus on the priority is literacy and numeracy, and not necessarily on physical education or physical literacy. And so we're, you know, we're spending almost seven and a half billion dollars per year per million people on things that are not preventative. If we look at sport, tourism, recreation, and healthy living, you can see the difference has now moved down to the millions, and so the investment is significantly less in what we are calling in Canada today the new health. It is a community-based approach through sport, through recreation, through education, um, sorry, through some education streams, where people are provided with the opportunity to go out and go to the local gymnasium to get, you know, to work out, if we call it that, to play in, uh, in organized sports. The whole focus is around getting the community active, but we make very little investment in relation to our investment of just not being sick. And if we look at Hippocrates' quote down below of a, num a number of thousands of years ago, the function of protecting and developing health must rank even above that of restoring and impaired. So like most of the Western world, we have this a little backwards. How do we start to change that dynamic a little bit? So the good news story around all this is that when we do move, we get lots of positive effects. We get lots of positive uh, things happening, and it makes a really big difference. Um, so when we when we do move, we get a better brain, better muscle, better bone, better heart, better body, better social life, better psychology. More, we were more productive. So and the and the research is is pretty strong in this area that when we are moving more, we just have a better situation and so it really does lend to the fact what are some of the things that a can help us move more often and what are some of the barriers that are preventing us from moving more often so let's talk a little bit more about physical literacy specifically um, last year uh, at the International Physical Literacy Conference in Vancouver Canada um, we adopted the International Physical Literacy Association definition for physical literacy, and that is physical literacy is the motivation, the confidence, the physical competence, knowledge, and understanding to value and take responsibility for engagement in physical activities for life. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it really gets down to five main points, which is if we're physically competent, we tend to be more confident and motivated to be active on a regular basis. And if we have a good knowledge and understanding of why we're doing it and why it's important, we will tend to value that for the rest of our life and reap the benefits of that. Along with what we did around the definition, we created what we call a consensus statement. And again, um, I'm going to make sure that a copy, a link to this consensus statement is sent out to everybody um, in in our in our in our group um, to ensure that um, uh, sorry it's just my Skype no it's um, what happens is uh, I just gotta get there we go good to go on. go back down yeah sorry. So um, with this consensus statement, it really focused on, we, we built it uh, largely to reinforce um, the uh, definition, but also to really give us a backbone with which to leverage off what physical literacy was. A lot of people think that physical literacy is just, um, uh, is just uh, your ability to move or your physical competence. It's more than that. Um, we're just, sorry, we just... Just have, oh, there we go. We're good. 
Excellent. So if we look at the first domain, we look at uh, the effective domain, and that basically ties in the motivation and confidence. An individual brings in an individual's self-confidence, self-assurance, their enthusiasm around doing things that are active. Uh, the second domain is physical competence. Of course, we understand the fundamental movement skills and, and building up those number of skills is really important. The third domain is cognitive and knowledge and understanding. Um, you know, the essential qualities that influence movement, why they're important. And then the fourth domain is really the behavior. And it's almost an outcome of the first three where if, if we really do, um, you know, address those first three well, we will find that the behavior over time will change. And that's really where we want to get to is having a better behavior around moving and, and, and appreciating and valuing that movement uh, that we're doing on a regular basis. So let's talk a little bit more about how physical literacy lines up with literacy and numeracy because I think that's a really, really important topic. Um, in, in, in the literacy model, which is a skill-based literacy, we understand that physical or physical literacy and numeracy, which are taught and valued in our schools and in and reinforced by parents at home with their kids, is that kids go to school and they learn their ABCs and they can from that alphabet they can form words and put together sentences and construct paragraphs and eventually they they develop a pretty rich and deep vocabulary to be able to write and create different things. Likewise with numeracy, um, we learn our one, two, threes, and then we can take those numbers and we can have fractions and do equations. And from there, uh, it empowers us to be able to be more comfortable with dealing with so many different components. So whether it's going to engineering school or whatever, you need to have good numeracy to be able to do those things. Now, both of those things are not only delivered in our schools, but they're reinforced in our homes as well. You know, it's important to read with your children so that they understand more words, the greater vocabulary they have. And it's intentionally skill-based, and it's intentionally done. Likewise of music, if you want to write music, it's important to be, you know, your do re mi, your scales and your scores. And then from there, you can construct songs and maybe become a famous Canadian superstar like Justin Bieber. Um, but in, when it comes to physical literacy, uh, just like your ABCs and your 123s, your movement of vocabulary needs to be developed intentionally and it needs to be learned. And, uh, in, and if you have a, a lot of good movement skills in your vocabulary, then you can learn how to sequence them together and, and modify them accordingly. And we know that through all the different activities we provide for kids in sporting settings and sporting situations, they are able to learn more skills and sequence them together and modify them and be aware of their environment, move around and do more tasks. And eventually they may be able to be quite accomplished at that. So... And we know that just, again, with, with kid, you've seen kids and maybe your own kids or if you're in a teaching space or an instruction space, you know there's some kids who pick up literacy faster than other kids. They're good at language arts, better than other kids. And there's kids that are better at math than other kids. And so they pick it up quicker and they do better at it. And it's likewise with physical literacy. There's kids who try a skill once, boom, they have it. And that's amazing. There's other kids that need four or five tries at that skill, maybe 10 or 11 tries, maybe 20 tries to before they before they get that skill down pat. So the, the challenge here is how do we give all of our kids enough practice to be able to hone and develop their physical literacy? Because again, we, our responsibility as supporters of the development of physical literacy in our society is we want to create the environment and the opportunity for physical literacy to be developed. That's, that's what we do. We don't go and teach people to be physically literate, per se. We create the environment and the opportunity for individuals to become more physically literate. So that's a, that's a very important distinction. If they don't get that opportunity to develop and learn and learn the steps and these skills over time, then everything stops. And we know that with illiteracy, it's a real barrier in society. If somebody's illiterate, they can't, they really can't move, you know, they can't progress through society near as successfully. If somebody can't move and they're not confident to move, then they won't move. And if they don't move, their health status long term is going to be problematic more often than not.
So these are some of the some of the situations that exist that we need to be very aware of and conscious about how we might be able to remedy if they exist if they are existing in your community. So we really want to put physical literacy and literacy and numeracy on the same footing so that they're equal. That is where we want to try and get it get things to be because we feel that learning to move is just as important as learning to read and write and that's a really important thing when we start to value things in that way we will tend to do them and comply and follow up with them in a different way if I compare it to 20 or 30 years ago we tended to value the freedom to be outside in the green space in the in in climbing trees, playing games, being engaged with our friends, we valued that to a much higher point than we do today. And what's happened today is adults have basically restricted that opportunity for kids to have that environment again. So I'll just uh, so when we're talking about types of fundamental movement skills, we're really talking about three main areas we want to focus on. So with the body, it's about balance and coordination and agility. Um, and it's important that we develop those skills as part of the process. We also have locomotor skills, running, jumping, hopping, skipping. Really depends on what you're doing. Not so much sliding and skating in the, in the Caribbean, um, but uh, a lot of it here in Canada where it tends to be a little bit white uh, for a lot longer in the year with our snow and our ice. Um, and then the last one is object manipulation. So that's sending and receiving and dribbling and striking. That's throwing things, catching things, kicking things. Um, and so it's really important that all three of these particular areas are addressed when we're developing movement skills, not just one or two of the areas. That We need to have a, a really rich and diverse skill set when it comes to this and, and skill offering. And then there's just a whole bunch more movement skills that uh, that really we want to make sure our kids uh, have that opportunity. Where this really starts to become uh, evident is when kids are in start moving up in sports, so they may be playing a sport, and they decide to specialize maybe at a very early age in a late development sport. So let's say soccer is an example. Um, so they decide at eight or nine that they're gonna they're just gonna play soccer. Well. We know that soccer offers a number of skills that it's uh, that it that are they're inherent to soccer. If if the child just keeps on playing soccer all the time, their their skill acquisition is going to be limited by just doing soccer. Just by the the you know there's lots of things you don't do in soccer that you would do in other sports, and so the idea of specializing at a young age limits the skill uh, the movement vocabulary opportunity and also the potential for greater and more diverse movement skill opportunity going forward. And it is one of just one of the many reasons why early specialization is not generally a good thing for a young person to do because it does not improve their athleticism to the point where they can potentially be a, you know and, and, and reaching their full potential. So it really does affect lots of different things. So I'm going to just sort of talk here a little bit about the difference between physical literacy, physical activity, and physical fitness. And so I'm just going to walk through this. So FMS, which is highlighted up there in the left-hand side of the screen in yellow, is fundamental movement skills. And that contributes to your movement vocabulary. So with fundamental movement skills, we, we want to be able to, like we said earlier, we want to be able to make sure we have lots of different skills in our vocabulary bucket, if we want to call it that. We want to have lots of different skills and we want to sequence them and modify them and, uh, and, and basically we use all the activities and games and practices we do with kids through physical activity and sport to utilize that vocabulary and hone those skills. If over time we do uh, allow those skills to be developed, we become more physically literate. So if we have a level of physical literacy, then we're more apt to be physically active. Um, so if 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 we're if we're more likely to be physically active, then we're more likely to participate more often. And if we participate more often, we generally get more fit. So if you can see how that cycle works, so if we have more skills 
and we're a more confident mover because we're more physically literate, then we'll generally tend to be more active. If we're more active, we'll tend to be participating more often. And then if we're participating more often, we'll generally tend to become more fit. You can see how that cycle feeds into itself. One of the bonuses of this is that if we're physically, if I have a level of physical literacy and a level of fitness, we tend to be more durable. And really at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to make more durable citizens. We want to have a better quality of life. I don't just not want to be sick. I want to have a better quality of life. And if I'm more durable and resilient, then I'm able to, to have uh, a better chance of that higher quality of life. And it's also very interesting that each person's pathway to physical literacy is very different. There's not one way to do this. And that's certainly depicted in this diagram where from birth everybody has their own trajectory, um, their own journey. And if you work in the instruction area or the coaching area or the teaching area, um, you really are helping manage an a number of individuals' physical literacy trajectories by providing guidance to them as they develop. So everybody's journey is a little different um, and that's sometimes it's going up and sometimes going down or it's squiggling around sideways. The key thing is there's not one set way to do this for everybody. With a new model of intervention, what we're proposing is we want to try and create that quality physical literacy experience. So with a quality physical literacy experience, which can be delivered by any number of delivery system portions of our system, so recreation, sport, through, through your work and vocation, performance arts, early childhood education, at school, physical education, rehabilitate, doesn't matter. Whichever way we deliver it, we also know that we can measure, we have a number of measurements through social, psychological, physiological, biomechanics. We can, we can measure it a whole, bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of ways. We currently don't have, um, well, we're starting to develop now. We can now measure the physical literacy of an individual, which is actually a, a, you know, a fairly new thing. We, there's a number of tools in Canada that now do that. The play tools are probably one of the better tools to, to assess an individual's physical literacy. At the end of the day, if, as an outcome, what we want to have is we want to have meaningful participation. And if we're really lucky, we hope to flourish. We hope to have, you know, have a high quality of life because we have been engaged uh, we're more physically literate, we're more confident to move, we're more motivated to move more often. And if we do have this meaningful participation and flourish, we generally will have better physical and mental health. We will not be impacting the justice system by, you know, maybe getting into trouble. And we might, you know, hopefully be more gainfully employed because we've got good health, we've got good focus. Um, lots of those things that, that really do lend to reducing some of the negative things that can happen. So it's, it's an interesting model uh, for intervention to try and change the status uh, of a person's health using physical literacy as one component. So aligning physical literacy with, with literacy, again going back to that skill-based model, we want to use the same language, so movement vocabulary. Vocabulary is used very frequently in the literacy model. You want to have movement fluency, your ability to execute um, with expertise. You want to have physical proficiency, so you're more proficient in moving uh, with each of those skills and hopefully become more physically literate because of that. So it's just utilizing the, the same language between literacy and physical literacy uh, and not trying to make it something different. We also know that physical literacy is not just in the domain of recreation and sport. Um, we tend to talk about it a lot there. We also tend to talk about it a lot being just about children and youth. Well, that's not the case. I mean, the reality is, is that you can become more physically literate at any time in your life. Would, would I say that when you're younger, your chances of becoming more physically literate are laying down a, a better foundation? Yeah, maybe, and that's probably why we tend to, unfoc to focus on kids, but that's the same reason why we deliver all their school and educational learnings at that time is because they're, they're, they're at some of the best time in their life to learn this stuff and ground it inside them. So just want to emphasize, 
children and youth an important area to focus on around physical literacy, but physical literacy can be learned over the lifespan, okay? It also is very prevalent in the performance arts. For anybody who has a dance background or no, has no circus at all, um, lots of emphasis on, on, on uh, proficient movement, confident movement, uh, mastery of movement, really important that uh, those things show up. In vocation, same thing. It's uh, it, if you have a physical job, if you're more physically literate, you'll be able to do, it'll be one of the factors to help you be able to do your job better and easier. Um, activities of daily living uh, here in Canada, and I'm sure not much different than in the Caribbean, we have a very large retiring baby boomer generation. A lot of these people are going to be retiring and, and uh, looking for activities to do, and some of them you know, may not have had a great experience, uh, especially women in particular uh, who are baby boomers who may not have uh, had a, a great physical education experience or sport experience when they were young because 30, 40, 50 years ago it wasn't necessarily that great an environment for girls and women. Um, so a lot of these people are retiring and how do we get them engaged at the age they're at now? How do we intro them into activities, say golf or if they want to take up a water sport? How do we make it so that they can feel comfortable, maybe learn some of the foundational skills first or reinforce those foundational skills, those fundamental movement skills first, then tar start teaching the technical skills so that they feel more confident. What happens with a lot of people is they come in with not very much foundation, try some of the technical skills of a sport or an activity, fail a couple of times, don't, aren't very motivated to come back and generally don't come back. So their experience has been very negative for them. For injury prevention, uh, again, um, just to give you an interesting number statistic, in Canada, um, $6.6 .6 billion a year is spent on falls. So that's just people falling down and hurting themselves. A lot of it happens with our older population. When they fall, they may break a hip and they end up in, fracture a hip and end up in the hospital. And in many cases, for a lot of these older people, um, they may not come out of the hospital ever again or they're spending a long time, huge burden on our healthcare system. So it's, it's really a problem. Um, and uh, until we change that, um, you know, we need to be looking at can we be more preventative in our actions around keeping our population more physically literate so that they're more engaged long term. We teach them actually how to fall as they get older uh, and, and what I mean by that is they learn how to land properly and we lower the incidences of a, a more severe or significant injury. It's, it's a, you know, we see lots of falls prevention programs, but part of falls prevention is actually teaching skills to be more durable and to do and know how to fall when that does happen. Uh, the last one I want to point out is that there's this, uh, there's this real imbalance between young men and young women, or men and women when it comes to a ACL, anterior cruciate ligament and your knee uh, rupturing. Uh, females have a higher ratio, six to one, of this happening. And uh, for a long time, they've been trying to figure out why that happened. Is it women's hips are wider, so the cue angle down to their knee, is that one of the reasons? No, not, that hasn't been evident. Uh, the hormone levels in women versus men, no, that doesn't seem to be the reason. Well, a recent study done by the NCAA in the United States um, showed that they could reduce the six to one ratio to 1.5 to one through a skills development program for girls and women, and it made a significant difference in reducing reducing injury. Um, so, in, so the skills development component, making them more physically literate, providing that environment and that opportunity, makes a big difference. Now, we want to also provide these activities that can develop physical literacy in a variety of environments. Most of it tends to be on the ground. Most of us spend because we're land-based animals. We tend to be most of the time on the ground. Now, in your part of the world, you get to spend a fair amount of time in the water as well, which is pretty good. Uh, it's important to be literate in the water as well. It, it, it's critical, actually, because if you're, if you're not a confident swimmer, then we know your chances of drowning are significant. Um, so that really isn't important from a public safety perspective. I'm going to suggest you don't have a lot of ice and snow, so that, that experience is probably not as prevalent for people in the Caribbean. And then 
fewer people, unfortunately, but some do get to practice moving in the air, which is kind of cool. But for little, you know, for young kids, that's even jumping on a trampoline and being comfortable to be up in the air for that for those couple seconds. It's stuff like that where they just feel more comfortable with their body. And how much are we doing this indoors versus outdoors? Uh, I know in our part of the world, uh, kids are not as engaged out, outdoors as they should be. And that appreciation for, for being outdoors and also the different experiences we can have out there really is missed because of that. So I want you to think about in your region, your community, do your kids get out and get into that, in, into the, into the open spaces more often or not? And why is that? You know, why is that not available to them? So really, at the end of the day, the gateway to active participation is physical literacy. Um, and it really is a journey, not a destination. It is a situation where um, it's not like one day all of a sudden you wake up and you're physically literate. Um, it is a journey over your lifespan. And uh, you know, I, I've talked about a number of examples at various stages and ages throughout our lifespan where if we were more confident movers, would we actually improve our quality of life through having a higher level of durability and less injury and or incident in our life? And for somebody to be active, do they need to be a confident mover first before they're even confident to start being active? And we feel that that's one of the number one reasons why people aren't active is they don't feel confident enough to move. So we need to really focus on that, int that intentional skill development component. Uh, this is our model in Canada. It's a revamped model. It's uh, the Canadian Sport for Life model. Um, it starts in at the bottom. Uh, I guess if, if I used, um, it's, it, it's a rectangle versus the traditional pyramid or triangle that used to be in place. And uh, it, um, it really is driven by the idea of being inclusive. Everybody can find a place in the model. So active start, uh, fundamentals and learn to train if I gave you sort of an age range would be 0 to 12 um, we tend to focus on developing physical literacy in that time span because it is a it is a, a better opportunity they're like little sponges to be able to take advantage of that uh, first involvement and awareness um, are really components of persons with a disability and their ability to be able to get engaged in the system at the appropriate time for them. But it really is including them at any phase wherever they decide to partake. Um, the small green, blue, blue triangle to the left is really the performance pathway, that small number of athletes that decide they want to go and be more dedicated, more serious, and they want to try and maybe go to their provincial games, their Canada games, national games, or even compete internationally, maybe go to the Olympics one day, play professional hockey in Canada is a big deal. Um, you know, so it, it really is a, a small part of the sport model. But it, you know, part of our feeling is that if we do a reasonably good job in the, in the younger part of the model that hopefully people will have a greater chance of being active for life, fit for life in their own way. And understanding that on the right hand side, going up the right hand side, that really you can be developing physical literacy throughout your lifespan. It's not just something that is the domain of four kids only. So who really makes things happen in a community around this? Well, in, in you know, many, and it doesn't really matter, in most of the Western world, the, the, the groups tend to be very much the same. There's recreation delivery, there's sport delivery, there's school delivery, and usually health is, is, uh, is delivering in their own way, usually health care. But what's health's role in, in sort of supporting and reinforcing these other components? Well, we know that most of the kids are in the school setting, so we think, well, if the school can do a better job at keeping them active and teaching them the skills, that'll help them in other places. Well, you know, we know in Canada, part of our challenge is that many of our elementary school teachers, so that's kindergarten to grade six, in most of our jurisdiction in Canada, are not trained to be specialized phys ed teachers. So it's a really mixed bag um, in the sense of how we get, uh, we don't get quality teaching experiences delivered to the kids. So it's a real weakness in the system. In recreation and sport, um, you have to show up for those things. You have to sign up. It's not necessarily part of society delivery. Now, in your community or your region, that may be different. You know, 
sport or recreation may be something that's available to everybody uh, and everybody partakes in their own way. It is available to everybody in Canada too, but the challenge is, is that you've got to show up, you usually have to pay for it and not, and a lot of people, you know, a significant number of people don't know about it, they don't know what it's about or they don't have the money to be able to do it, so it's a bit of a barrier sometimes. But what can the all these sectors do together to work to, to you know, to really develop a physically literate community and that's one of our goals is how can we help communities become physically literate because everything really does happen at the community level the delivery of everything is happening in communities around the world so whether it's just starting out at the very beginning in, in the playground or if you're trying to be a high performance athlete and be on the podium internationally playground to podium um, it all happens in communities and, and so communities are a really valuable place to focus in on and how do we get the different delivery groups, so it's a YMCA, it's a church group, it's whatever, how are they working together to create a greater activity opportunity in our communities? So I'm just going to share a little bit of data here from uh, an intervention that we did in uh, in the province of Ontario, which is our largest province here in Canada, it's about 14 million people. Um, this is Ontario after school program. In Ontario, there are uh, about 20,000 20, kids are in a, in a government supported program um, because they're, they, uh, they have lower socioeconomic, they come from lower socioeconomic uh, 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 communities um, and they're, kids to, they're deemed to be kids at higher risk. So we did an intervention, not a research study, just an intervention where we delivered the ability to assess fundamental movement skills, or in this case, fun, um, more than that, um, assess physical literacy, and all and through through a tool called the Play Tool, Play Fun Tool, it assesses 18 skills and tasks, um, not exhaustive, but pretty representative of what what a uh, what a, uh, a young person should know. Um, and then, uh, so that's uh, indicated in the orange, and then in the in the red or pink, um, that was um, a questionnaire performed by each of the kids on how they felt about their own movement. So I'll tell you what happened. Um, what we found over a four-month period, and this was in January of 2014, is we found there's the 18 skills and tasks that go down uh, the the x-axis, and um, you can see that there was upwards of a four to six percent improvement. Those uh, numbers down below are, are 100 millimeters, which would be representative of up 100 percent. So there was upwards of a six percent improvement by the whole group. But one of the things we found, which was a bit concerning, was when we look at this graph, is everything to the right is boys and everything to the left is girls. And what we found in this population, um, largely 8 to 13 year olds with some kids on either side of those ages, um, was that uh, the boys were developing physical literacy at a greater rate than the girls. Now all of it was pretty low. Um, the and that's probably what led to the you know greater improvement. Usually when you're quite a bit lower it's easier to show some improvement with some sort of intervention. So other than skipping, uh, girls were develop and galloping. Uh, girls were um, were developing physical literacy at a lower level than boys. So very concerning. We actually did this three more, two more times as an intervention, and found this same data come up. And we're and so now what's happened is a formal research project has been launched. We're currently delivering it through McMaster University out of Hamilton and near Toronto. And what's happening is, is that we're now focusing on trying to find out why is this happening. And if we can find out why it's happening, make some recommendations on how to alleviate that and then do a pilot to deliver some of those recommendations and see if it makes a difference. So that research will probably come, uh, come out in the early 2017. Um, from the data we collected, so dribbling ball with a foot, you can see blue is boys, green is girls. They sort of parallel each other up and then as they get uh, sort of 11, 12, 13, there was a bit of an aberration at 14, it was a very small sample size. Uh, but you can generally see that girls drop off more than boys in this particular skill. Concerning around this is confidence. 
So we see with the confidence that was assessed over this with this sample size, which is pretty pretty good size sample, over 5,000 kids. Um, blue is boys, green is girls. You can see that at the younger ages, the girls were actually doing very well with their confidence um, until about age eight. And then at age eight, things start to drop off. And again, there's that small aberration at 14. But generally speaking, what's happening is that girls are actually not getting as much time on task. Their competence level in being able to move and their confidence level to move is now changing. And because of that, we're seeing a lot more young teenage girls not moving very much because they're not confident movers. So we're seeing a lot of this showing up. So what are, you know, what are, what, what are some of the things we can do around that? Um, we also did the questionnaire for, for kids. So in the questionnaire, part of the questionnaire asks, how do you value reading and writing in three different domains? So you can see on the left hand, and, and if you look at the x-axis, it's, uh, it's valuing it at the valuing it to be very important at the top of the scale and just somewhat at the bottom of the scale. So when we look at the red round circle, upper right, upper left hand corner of of uh, of the of the graph, how do you value reading and writing in school? Well, they value it quite high, uh, and of course we would think that they would value reading and writing to be very important in school. How do you value reading and writing at home with your family? Not as much. How do you value reading and writing? That's the green diamond. With your friends, not so much at all, okay? It's much lower. So how do you value mathematics or numeracy in school? Well, even higher than reading and writing because it's one of the only places we actually do math. Uh, how do you value reading or math at home with your family? Not as much. And how do you value math with your friends? Well, it's, I don't think it's you know the topic of discussion too often amongst kids. Then we asked them about movement, not physical literacy, but movement, so that you know they could understand a little better. How do you value movement in school? Well, they don't value it as high in school as reading and writing because the adults have, have made it very clear that reading and writing and, and math are the priority. And so the kids pick up on that. How do you value movement at home with your family? Higher than reading and writing and math. And how do you value movement with your friends? Well, pretty darn high and significantly more than reading and writing and math. And it really becomes the social connector for kids in particular. The social cohesion point is through movement and whether it's through activities they do together or through a sport team or various other things, this is such as an important piece. And more beyond just the physical outcomes of being active, the social component is so important. Even think in your own settings, if you're doing exercise with others, if you go to a class and then maybe go for a coffee afterwards, it's a very social thing. And so the social component of physical movement is a big priority and it really needs to be valued and focused in on in any sort of programs that are delivered. So I wanted to sort of leave off on a couple of resources here. Um, we will send out a PDF of this uh, PowerPoint to everybody, um, so that's not a problem. We'll make it available. Here's some websites that have uh, a fair amount of information on um, on physical literacy and actually the bottom one, the lin.ca one, we're working with them right now to basically organize and catalog all the online physical literacy resources in the world um, in English and uh, and actually uh, make the inventory them and catalog them so they're easier to find and also build what we call a learning lab to help people better understand how to use these resources. Um, we anticipate this project will be done by late July of this year and will be available to everybody who wants to use it. Um, just uh, we're very lucky that uh, the Ontario government has is is made some investment in helping us deal with some of these resources. So it's an exciting piece going forward. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank you very much. If, if anybody has um, uh, a question, now is there a chat box here guys? What's, uh, where is the chat box? If anybody wants to type in anything into the chat box, um, you're welcome to do that. Um, we have run a little over uh, the time frame. I want to be sensitive around that I'm, and apologize again for um, uh, for uh, um, the late start we had. 
um, I'm hoping that you felt um, that uh, the topic was uh, was was dealt with in uh, in in a reasonable way. Um, so really looking forward to uh, to potential next steps. Uh, I will be coming to the Caribbean in uh, in the fall, in September. Uh, coming to I'm coming to six countries actually, um, and looking forward to working hopefully with some of you in in doing that and uh, talking more about physical literacy and how we can really start to operationalize that and make it uh, more of a reality in each of your communities. So uh, thank you again and. Uh, um, Appreciate your interest in this topic and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.